Since I was a teenager, I had, uh, I've enjoyed the hobby of photography. Um, should be better at it than I am, but uh, I enjoy it. Um, and, I, and I think there's just something about capturing a moment uh, for remembrance, for reflection, for... Um, well, let me say a little bit about it. So here's a, here's a shot that I took. Uh, it's, I, I get some, some of these images kind of just rotating on my screensaver. Um, uh, but I... Um, I, I, that's Puerto Rico. It's very, very beautiful. Uh, Anne's uh, mom took uh, the family away on a vacation over the winter. Uh, wanted to kind of get everybody together, um, uh, 16 of us. And um, I, I mean, I could hardly believe I had the privilege to stand in such a place of, of beauty and just, just witness something like that. Um, uh, here's Elbow Falls this summer, um, a little closer, catching it just at twilight. Um, with the, the water flowing over, and you kind of grab these moments uh, of time and try to freeze frame it. We sometimes refer to it as a snapshot. That's old language, I know, but, but it's, it's this kind of idea. Um, here's interior BC, um, again, this summer, right? Oh, misty eye on the mountain below. You know, so it, it was in the rain, and um, just this incredible beauty in the midst... So, so when, we, when, we take a, when we take a photograph, or maybe when you paint a, a work of still art, um, it's, it's as though you get this opportunity to, to take a moment in time and freeze it, and, and linger on it for a few moments, um, uh, memorialize what was taking place you know, in that. Sometimes there's the moments before, sometimes there's the moments after, sometimes it's just, oh, that is so beautiful. Can I, can I just capture that in some way and, and retain it into some measure? Um, and, and one of the other things that I love about it is that sometimes it, it helps us forget some of the things that preceded or, or that which followed, right? So like it, the, 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 the hard sweat climb up to the vista to take the picture. You know, okay, that kind of fades. Oh, such a great hike. Um, the moron that cut you off on the road um, before you pulled over to take the photo. Uh, it fades into the background. You know, if it's a family portrait, maybe it was those moments of chaos leading up to say cheese. <laughs> um, uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's forgetting how threatening the road felt as it was wet and slippery as you were making your way along. But, but for a moment... For a moment, we get to glimpse at and, 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 and hold on to what I would suggest is a reflection of the Garden of Eden, a, a reflection of God's pristine, beautiful presence in our world. And though it's messed up and these other things would call us aside and call to distract us, maybe even try to overwhelm us, every now and then we, we get... A moment. I hope you've had some of those moments th this summer. When was the last time you had a moment when maybe you could say, it is well with my soul. Uh, maybe it was in your backyard. Maybe it was out for a ride. You, you know, maybe, it, maybe it was with friends. But, but the, these moments when I think this is a taste of what God intended. The garden is more than a place, though, though I'm convinced that it was a place and will be a place yet again when God wraps all this up. But it's more than a place. The garden, as, as, as we reflect on it in the pages of Genesis chapter 2, it, it was, in part, it was a state of mind or a state of being, it, it was a way of existing and experiencing the joy, the fullness, the wonder, the mystery of what God had created. Um, maybe still photography, maybe fine art will allow us to experience just a taste of that again, a hint of the garden, it, it, as fleeting as it may be. We've got these, this, this image maybe that helps us retain, maybe helps us go there again. We forget, don't we? Helps us remember, oh yeah, I did have a vacation this year, didn't I? <laughs> helps us go there again. Um, speaking of images, last Sunday we were in Genesis 1 and, and recounting the fact that God has placed his image in us. 
Uh, that we become image bearers. We represent him was the language that we used last Sunday. Um, he has placed you, uh, you belong, in the pristine realm of his creation. And in doing so, he set you there to represent him. Uh, like a king of old uh, would have installed uh, a statue, an image of himself, to reflect his reign and rule in that which was chaotic and then he brought into order and brought under his rule and his reign. And he's given us management responsibilities. He's given us leadership responsibilities. We're to work in the chaos of this world and call it back into order, call it back into submission to him. And what's more, he has created this world specifically for you. We reflected on the fact that the first five days of creation all build up and anticipate day six. The first five days, the crafting of the setting into which day six, the crown jewel gets placed. We likened it to like an engagement ring. You know, as beautiful as the setting may be and as precious as the metals are, and then the diamond gets put in place and the light refracts through it and we are like, wow, that is beautiful. And, and all, of this, all of this is an evidence of God's love for you, his priority for you, his love, his desire that you would be cared for and that his greatness would be seen through you as you bear his image. Not all, not all worldviews are like this. In fact, most are not. Most see, most see our, 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 our humanity at war with the elements struggling for survival against all the odds. Um, uh, most of the ancient, uh, ancient worldviews that talked about the creating of the realm, uh, they used language like the gods were uh, looking for ways to get out of doing work so they created human beings. Uh, you know, that's all that we are. That's not the picture that Moses painted in Genesis 1, Genesis 2 of humanity. He painted the picture of a loving God who, who longed who longed that he would affect his reign and rule. And we're going to talk today about longed that there would be relationship and would invite you into it. Because there's more going on than what we've already discovered as we've worked our way through this text. God is present with us in this creation. God's created a place for you to belong. He's created a place for you to belong. He belongs you belong, and we belong together. That's the outline. It's in your sermon notes if you want to pull them out and follow along. Let me read for us uh, from Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to start at verse 4. Um, I'm going to invite you to stand with me since those chairs are... Uh, we're going to be in comfy chairs pretty soon. Then I'm going to have to work really hard to keep you awake. <laughs> Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 4. I'm going to read down through the end of the, uh, the chapter. If you're looking it up digitally, I'm in the New Living Translation, NLT. It will also be on the screen here. Chapter 2, verse 4, uh, first half of the verse ends what preceded. This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth, for the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. And then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed from the land of Eden, watering the garden and then dividing into four branches. The first branch, called the Pishon, flowed from uh, around the entire land of Havilah, where gold is found. The gold of that land is exceptionally pure. Aromatic resin and onyx stone are also found there. The second branch, called the Gihon, flowed around the entire land of Cush. The third branch, called the Tigris, flowed east to the land of Asher. The fourth branch is called the Euphrates. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may eat freely of the... Uh, eat, sorry, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. 
So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals, all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, all the wild animals, but still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. And last, the man said, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. This is the word of the Lord. May he help us understand it and begin to apply it in our lives this morning. You may be seated. God has placed, God has created a place for you to belong. He belongs here, you belong here, and we belong together. Let's kind of just unpack that conceptually for a few minutes. He belongs. You and me as image bearers, bearing the image of God, reflecting the likeness of the king and his reign and his rule in this place that he's created, this place where he's brought order together out of chaos, we are his ambassadors. We're to represent him here. But there's something else going on here too. The language in Genesis chapter 1 that's being used to describe God's creating work. It's the language that's reminiscent in the ancient world of, of building an ancient temple. The language is somewhat poetic. It's, it's beautiful. It describes the, uh, the installation of beauty. It uses language like, like this world was, was formless. It was empty. It was dark. But then it took shape and we were commanded to fill it, and, and light uh, radiated everywhere. Uh, there, there was space. Uh, there was earth and sky. There was, there was uh, water and land. Uh, There's beautiful, nourishing vegetation in this temple that had been created. In the ancient world, when a people would build a temple for a so-called god, they would often install an image of that deity they were trying to honor in that temple. Well, lo and behold, God builds this temple for us and then puts us to represent his image in that space. It's this enormous, glorious, spectacular temple that he's created. But there's even more. You see, the language that's used in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, probably seems a little unusual to us. I didn't read that part. Uh, so, uh, the creations of the heaven and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. Was God tired? Like, like, did he, had he exhausted himself in those first six days and like he needed to take a day off? Is that what's going on here? I, I, I mean, the psalmist, Psalm 121 says he never sleeps nor slumbers. So, so how, does, how do we reconcile that? I mean, this isn't a reference to God taking a nap. This is a reference to God himself coming and taking up residence in this cathedral that he has constructed. He created this space for us, but he has come himself as resident within his creation. He belongs here. The Old Testament prophet, Isaiah, he writes in chapter 66, he says, this was what, is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Could you build me a temple as good as that? Could you build me such a resting place? My hands have made both heaven and earth. They and everything in them are mine. I, the Lord, have spoken. He belongs in this place. Uh, he, he belongs, it's appropriate that we would worship him in this space. Part of the reason that all of creation testifies to his greatness is because he's created it to be so. The articles of the temple point to the one that it was designed to honor. He belongs here in this place. He's created for you to be with him. 
you belong in this place too. Our youngest, Christy, got her learner's permit this week. <laughs> well, she spent some time, kind of some early driving experiences at Grandma's farm this summer, driving the pickup truck around the farm, driving the garden tractor, a few things like this. You know how you maneuver a machinery, right? But she got a learner's permit this week, so Dad took her out on some of the country roads around here. It takes some time to be comfortable in the place that you're supposed to be. You're allowed to be there, right? You got your license, you're allowed to be. But it takes some time to get comfortable there. Mom put her in the van instead of the, the minivan instead of my car, and that was a whole different experience, right? New driver, that just feels weird. This is, it takes time to be comfortable behind the wheel. Well, as image bearers, we need to begin to think about what it means for us to represent God in order for us to be comfortable in this place that he's designed us to be. Like this is where we belong here with him in this space. Look at God's words on day six, if you would. Chapter one, verse 26, if you have our Bibles open. Um, Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Okay, I'll, I'll connect the dots here for you in a minute. Um, does anything strike you uh, as strange in that sentence? Um, I mean, the translators are interacting with the ancient Hebrew, um, Hebrew language, uh, writing that for us. And there's at least a couple of things that we read there. We say, Whoa, what do they mean by that? So, so one of them is this. The word God is plural. Okay, in the ancient Hebrew, uh, the, the word is Elohim. Um, it, it's a masculine noun with a plural ending on it. Um, and we say, well, that might just be a strange thing, and we just blow past it. Um, except, as we continue to work our way through the pages of Scripture, we discover uh, that, that we're encountering God the Father, and, and then God the Holy Spirit, and then we get to the New Testament and we're introduced to God the Son. And we say, well, what, uh, the Old Testament clearly declared there is one God. And we begin to understand that he is manifest in three persons. Uh, and we can't wrap our heads around that, though it's worth trying. Uh, but centuries of brilliant minds have said this seems to be incompatible. And yet in the greatness of God, it is. There is one God, and he exists, he's, he's manifest in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We sometimes refer to this idea as the Godhead, or the Trinity. Uh, one God, three persons, and he's created us to be like him, and the language here that's used is let us make human beings in our image, and we look at that and say, well, is, is this somehow is this a, an anticipation of what's yet to be revealed about the nature and the person of God? If nothing else, we kind of look at that language around the, the Godhead and we say, three who are one living together in perfect harmony, this is a relational God. He exists in perfect relationship within himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Perfect community. He had no reason, no need to create us except that we are now invited into that relationship. We're invited into that community. Now, there's more here, though. So throughout Genesis chapter 1, Moses refers to God in the generic kind of masculine plural noun Elohim. God created. Elohim created. Um, it fits quite well. It's a broad general narrative. It's describing broad strokes what God did. Quick aside. It describes what God did. It describes who did it. It's not science. This is the language of an ancient writer, and this is not going into the details of how he did this. We could have a whole separate conversation about that, but the primary point of the text here is to declare that God did it. Okay? Um, generic, first chapter, Elohim, God. Second chapter, it gets very, much more personal, right? Like it's describing God breathing into the life, into the man. It's a highly personal chapter. Moses' language changes and he begins to refer to Yahweh, Elohim. Most of our English translations are the Lord God. And, and it goes on to describe what the Lord God did. Well, this is, remember, this is Moses' writing, 
And he's referring back to that encounter he had as a young man that's recorded for us in Exodus chapter 3 when God revealed himself to Moses, giving him the personal name for God. Remember Moses? The, Egyptian, the, the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, uh, becoming too numerous. Pharaoh decided to annihilate the, the, the little boys, population limitation. Um, Moses' mom puts him in the, the bushel basket and floats him in the Nile and sisters watching and Pharaoh's daughter finds him and takes him in, raises him as her, her, her own. Moses is given the, the best education the ancient world could have. It was a pretty decent education as far as we can tell. And then he's out kind of doing his princely duties when he sees Hebrews being abused. He steps in, murders a man, and then flees for his life. Eventually marries a gal and, and, and is caring for sheep and goats on the, mount, uh, on the side of Mount Sinai when this bush bursts into flame but doesn't be consumed. And God speaks to him out of the bush and says, I want you to go back and, and, and free my people. I've, I've equipped you to be a leader. You're talking about being equipped for God equipping us for our assignments. I've equipped you to be a leader. Now I want you to go and lead. And we get to chapter 3 of Exodus, verse 13. Moses protested, If I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? And then what shall I tell them? And God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Uh, that's the beginnings of the, the Hebrew form of the, the name Yahweh, the personal name Yahweh. I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Uh, Jewish people even today consider that name so sacred they refuse to pronounce it in public. They'll substitute Adonai, which is the Hebrew generic name for Lord, lowercase l, if you're in your English translation Bibles. Uh, Yahweh, uh, Jehovah, a mispronunciation uh, of the word, um, capital L, uh, Lord, usually L-O-R-D, all caps um, in, our, in our English Bibles. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Now go and call together all the elders of Israel, tell them, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me, and he told me, I have been watching closely, and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. I have promised to rescue you from your oppression in Egypt, and I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Well, Moses does that. They leave. They cross the, the Red Sea into the wilderness, a journey that should have taken 10 or 11 days, ended up taking 40 years because of their disobedience, and they're on the, the verge of the promised land. Moses, gathering together oral traditions, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes Genesis, Exodus, the majority of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Hand of editors, out of evident there, here and there. But, but the majority of it, written by Moses. And here he's, really, he's looking back on that uh, incident, and he's able to say, the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, created you. The personal God enters into this personal narrative in Genesis chapter 2 in a highly personalized form of his knowing you and his creating us in order to draw us into this perfect community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, into this perfect relationship in this temple that he's created where we are to represent the king, where we also represent the deity who's to be worshipped in this space. All of this space pointed to the greatness of him who has made made us and calls us. You belong here. You are not a mistake. It is highly intentional on God's part that we are where we are, even at this point in history. And he's created you as a relational being like himself. And his intent was that you would enjoy he himself in that perfect fellowship, that perfect community. But there's even more. You see, if we only went that far, and we would say, okay, right, it's me and God, isn't that a lovely, you know, relationship? You know, we'll just do life together. But it gets even more personal than this. In the midst of the specifics of God creating human beings, we come to chapter 2, verse 18, and we read this. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. 
What? In the midst of this perfect creation, in the midst of this pristine environment, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Now, I'm pretty sure that I have had that passage read or read it myself at every wedding I've ever conducted in the last 26, 27 years of pastoral ministry. Um, Moses, just a few verses later, goes on to describe God's resolution to uh, this relationship problem. It's not good for the man to be alone. But let's not miss the primary assessment. Though he would be with us, and we are invited into relationship with him in this spectacular cathedral, it's not good for the man to be alone. We were created for relationship. We need relationship. God placed uh, us in this place where we belong. He belongs, you belong, but we belong together. You need other people in your life by God's design. From the ground up, as great as God is and as wonderful and as powerful as he is uh, and and as as, as mystical as the fellowship that we can have with the Godhead can be, he is still other and you need one like you. We need one another. The story is spectacular of how this proceeds. God and Adam search the earth, and Adam names the creatures that he finds it, but it says no suitable helper was just right for him. No correspondent to him, equal to him, a mate to partner in the work he was assigned to. So the Lord God took radical steps, and out of the man's side, he created, wow, Wow. In the Hebrew, it's Isha. Isha. Adam, 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 man, Isha, woman. I I, I think it's very intentional. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. And you know, you'd think after all of that spectacular creative work and this incredible declaration of the two now together being made one, that every marriage thereafter would be this blissful naked in the garden experience, right? <laughs> like, you just think that it would be perfection from there on out. And then we come to Genesis chapter 3. Oh, right? The fall of humanity. That first failure to trust and obey God, even though we were placed in this pristine setting. Sin came. Division between husband and wife. Division between all of us as human beings. Division between humanity and God, who had lovingly lovingly created us. I mean, what a sad tale chapter 3 becomes. So could we just set that aside for a minute longer? Like, could we come back and just linger in the garden a little longer? Snapshot, photograph, piece of fine art where we would just be well with our soul in this moment. You don't have to be married to enjoy deep, meaningful community. Um, Why why could I say that? I can say that because Jesus demonstrated that. You you don't have to be married to enjoy deep, meaningful community. Uh, Jesus demonstrated that you can live a completely fulfilled life. Now, here's what I mean by fulfilled. You can fill God's purpose for you in this life and never marry. The prophet Daniel demonstrated that. Uh, The apostle Paul demonstrated that. Marriage is good, but it will never save you. In fact, in the crucible of marriage, uh, your flaws will be highlight. You add one or two or three children to the mix, and I guarantee you that, that, that all of your flaws are going to come out. All of your weaknesses are going to be exposed. You know, you, know, you take, where's Tim? You take your kids, uh, you know, six of you in a van and drive them to the East Coast and back, and uh, there's some friction going to happen. You know, you take your family and move them across uh, the ocean, uh, to, and there's going to, there's, God is going to refine you through your family. 
You know, he's placed them around you very intentionally because he's got work to do in you and they are the instruments by which he's going to do that work. You can resist that work or you can submit to that work and say, oh God, oh God, I need your help. But you don't have to be married in order to fill God's loving purposes for you. Uh, when marriage is not possible, meaningful community still is. But he is concerned for your well-being. And that's why he offers meaningful community in this place that he's created for us. He offers little places, microcosmos, if you will. <laughs> Within the grand community, he has created smaller and accessible community. And it's the gathering of God's people. It's what we call the church. When we, when we get it right, it's a beautiful thing. Though admittedly, we rarely get it right. Like we only occasionally kind of get it mostly right, maybe some of the time, right? But this is God's design to satisfy the relational needs that, that are present in us. And, and we don't get it right, and yet this is his commission. We are to belong together. And then we are to welcome belongers. We're to be an open system that invites anyone who's willing to come and find belonging, to find welcome, to find embrace. This place was created for belonging. We've been talking about building a place to belong over the last three, four years. Um, that we called to grow, building a place to belong. And we're really, like God values place. Not all systems of the world do. Some find themselves at odds with the created realm. God values place. He's bu he builds stuff. In fact, when we build stuff, when we create, we're actually, in one sense, reflecting the creativity of the creator. We're enacting some of what it means for us to be image bearers. But the place that we are creating is a place for you and me and all those who are yet to come to belong. As I wrap up, I'm going to invite the worship team to come and just prepare to, to, to lead us in response. But I have four, four requests for you here this morning. The first is that if you are not in relationship with God, you need to change that. If you're not in relationship with God, you need to change that. He made you for himself, and you will never be complete apart from him. Confess the reality that you've been living your life independent of him. And then apologize to him for it. I'm sorry. And then change it. Begin to live life with him, walking with him. Through the work of Jesus, this has been made possible. If you'd like to talk about that after myself, any of our prayer team over by the cross, we would be delighted in helping you take that step. Here's a second request. If you're not in relationship with other followers of Jesus, fix that. That's broken, friend. We are meant to be in relationship with one another. It's not good for you to be alone. We, we, we have created, as a church family, life groups as our primary response to that need. Um, please join one. Purpose this fall to join one. Within the next week or two, we'll have an initial listing of groups, when they meet, and, and invitations for you to get involved. Here, here's the third request. If you are lonely, please let us know. Please tell us. We, we'll do our level best to try to minister to you in a helpful way. Fourth request, we need to resolve to welcome new belongers. Such is the commission of the church. We need to resolve to welcome new belongers. In just a few weeks, we'll open our doors to a new sanctuary and we'll invite everyone who's ever been a part, ever had any association with us to come celebrate with us. And we're going to invite everybody who's never walked through the door, maybe never even considered that God created them with purpose and design and loves them to come through the doors too. And we've got to figure out how to be a place of belonging. It begins with a warm handshake. Uh, we, we've been able to celebrate that you're pretty good at that. That's fantastic. But, but know that that's just the first step. 
We need to then move beyond just warm handshakes into a full embrace, into friendship making, into space creating, into to, to opportunities to help join us in, in serving, in loving, and in building meaningful community together. We're going to talk about this more over the next Sunday or two. I want to invite you to stand with me. Lord Jesus, we need your help in all of this. And so we ask that you'd hear the songs we would sing in response this morning. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.